Listen up. Welcome to the PowerShell Podcast, the podcast for PowerShell and the PowerShell community. The PowerShell Podcast is a PDQ production, making device management simple, secure, and pretty damn quick. And now, here's your hosts, Jordan Hammond and Andrew Plaw. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the PowerShell Podcast. I'm Megastar Jordan, along with even more mega Earth star Andrew Plaw. Wow. And today, today we've got special guest Emil Larson, who we're bringing him in for the the pre-show content, as a large portion oh. of it is his blog stuff. So oh, there's hello. no, yeah, there's no wait. You're in right now. You're live. Go. <laughs> <laughs> hello, everyone. So uh, uh, my name is Emil. Uh, I I am a, a huge fan of the uh, the podcast and. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I mean, they, they, uh, you guys brought me in here. I'm so happy for it. And uh, let's talk some PowerShell. It's going to be a fun time. Yeah. PowerShell. And you know what? Appreciate your support. Yeah, you've been listening for a while and giving us support and keeping us going. So awesome to get you in here. And, you know, you're not just a listener. You're a contributor in this fun community. <laughs> and we're looking forward to talking to you and sharing your experience as someone kind of going up through PowerShell and contributing to the community and blogs and we got modules and we got all kinds of good stuff. So, so glad we could have you here, man. And you were telling us on the pre-show that you've listened to a lot of the episodes. So it sounds like, or you feel like you've already talked to us, even though we, it's our first time meeting. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, one of these things when you, you know, listen, you're, you're out walking the dog and you're listening to, uh, to, to PowerShell, uh, people just uh, talking and, uh, it's kind of a funny feeling when you're actually sitting here uh, talking. So, uh, uh, yeah, glad you're having me on. It's going to hey, be a fun hour here. I always say friends of the podcast, right? <laughs> We're friends of the podcast, friends of the PowerShell community. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, are you going to be able to listen to your own episode? Uh, no, no, yeah. I, I won't listen to it. I won't even, you know, share it to my friends. Although I think my friends will will actually find it anyhow. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's how it goes. You'd that, be surprised. That, that's, uh, you know, that that's a part of being kind of an introverted IT person that I am. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's the uh, that's the common answer. Is <laughs> it's, it's part of the game. I can relate to that. I was playing pickleball last week and somebody who doesn't work in IT who also plays pickleball came up to me and said that they saw the podcast somehow. Um, All right. Yeah, and they're not PowerShell users. So you never know who stumbles across these things. Yeah, exactly. You made it into superstar status. <laughs> Must have been. This, this pickleball thing that you have been uh, talking about on the episodes, uh, can you enlighten me who, who, who is not so you know into alternative... Uh, Sports, so to yeah. say. Yeah. So it's sort well, what's of it about? tennis on a smaller court with some elements of ping pong. Um, it's a lot of fun. The ball kind of travels a little slow, but kind of fast mm -hmm. at the same time. It doesn't bounce too high. And it's All just right. a fun game. It's nice. You can play with old people. You can play with kids. They pick it up real quick. Um, and then, you know, there's obviously a sl pretty small pro scene, but it's mostly mm -hmm. just a fun recreational sport. It's kind of yeah. taking off over here. I think oh, okay, so. the major appeal for it is all demographic players, like all age groups. So mm -hmm. if you're looking for a way to get exercise in and uh, you might be a little bit older, you can still go out and play pick pickleball and be competitive at it. So it, it draws in a lot of people that way. All right. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice community. Stuff. Good chance to get out of the office and just talk to some people who know nothing about PowerShell. <laughs> yeah. Ping pong but, is usually, you know, the IT thing that you, you, you do otherwise. But pickleball, I mean, it's a good alternative. In our offices at our headquarters uh, in Salt Lake City, we have an indoor court mm -hmm. put up in uh, one of our rooms. So a lot of our IT team and different teams get down yeah. and play pickleball. It was oh, overbooked. Good. We added a second court. There's two courts now? Yeah. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> it's taking off then, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But... This is a pre-show. You know, we, we covered some non-PowerShell content. Now let's dive into some of the best blogs of recent history. Now, I want to get started off, start off a little light before we get to some of yours, Emil, which is we have a blog from Richard Hicks, PowerShell commands that always on VPN administrators should know. So if you are using always on VPN, this is a pretty helpful blog from Richard Hicks to take you through. 
some helpful commands. Link in show notes. Yeah. I like it. So I, I thought it'd be more client based, but looking through it, like the commands are more uh, like get the connection statistics for your server. So it's more of a tracking. It, it's more of a server admin side, which is not my initial take when I read the title. So it's kind of a it's, it's worthwhile read, especially if you're looking to track, I guess, coming and going of users out there. It's always nice when you can use PowerShell to get data that you can then share with managers or other people. Or a lot of times whenever you implement a solution, <clears throat> you want to kind of sort of automate the check-ins on it to make sure things are still running. Um, and by understanding the PowerShell commands that are available to you, well, now you're able to query data and you might be able to use it for helpful things. I know there's a lot of people out there that uh, myself included in the past where you implement a project and just kind of move on and never check on it again. And then you create some IT debt and then, uh, yeah, you hear about it, maybe at your next job, your old boss calls you and tells you that, hey, this thing you set up isn't working too hot. So do things the right way. Now, Emil, we were saying earlier, you've been through it, man. You're living the community lifestyle and we love to see it. And you have a pretty awesome Azure blog that we want to plug. But before that, I want to get into your blog about contributing to PowerShell docs. So what is that blog about? Yes, everyone should do it. It's it's about contributing to the PowerShell community and while doing so, learning a bunch of stuff. Uh, stuff that will, uh, I mean, have an impact on, on your career on a, on a very positive note. So um, for instance, uh, the, the whole PowerShell uh, docs uh, repository is based on Markdown. Um, and Markdown is just, uh, you know, regular files uh, that, that you can version control with Git. And um, uh, being part of such a large repository uh, over at PowerShell Docs uh, repo is um, going to give you a lot of uh, experience. Uh, and uh, you're also helping, you know, the community uh, with writing documentation for PowerShell. Uh, I, I can't think of the numbers, but I know that's it's a huge audience that the PowerShell Docs uh, sits on. So, so your, 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 your stuff that you will be writing uh, and uh, spell checking and um, adding examples uh, and verifying that examples will be uh, good, they will have a real impact on a lot of admins. And um, yeah, I just can't recommend it enough. Uh, there's an awesome project on the PowerShell uh, Docs repository that uh, Mikey Lombardi, a uh, superstar created and uh, yeah you can it's called PowerShell docs contribution contributing uh, I think and you can go there and there's a lot of documentation on how to get going uh, setting up your uh, local git and your github and uh, yeah just go at it have fun nice. um, read my blog uh, and uh, try your best Great suggestion. Yeah, PowerShell yeah. docs are viewed by tons of people and getting some of these GitHub, Git, Markdown, source control stuff underneath your belt is going to be massively helpful for when you want to make different contributions or bigger contributions. You can really lay that groundwork that you can then build on because that's so much of what this is, yeah. is where to do the hard things in PowerShell, you got to put down a lot of bricks to kind of get there. And this is just another one of those things that you're going to have to uh, cross off your list eventually. And PowerShell Docs is a great way to do it. And definitely reach out to the community if you're struggling or maybe want a tag team partner. I think people are really willing to help on this and we love seeing people contribute. So get active. You can always hit us up um, and, and we'd be happy to help you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't agree enough. It's a uh, it's su super good opportunity to learn. Um, um, Git particularly, uh, force yourself to, to, to use Git via the command line and, and you will be able to do a lot of things uh, uh, regardless of what your role uh, is at the moment. So um, I use Git uh, uh, all the time now uh, in, in my job and Markdown as well, um, writing documentation, um, writing readme files um, for my PowerShell stuff. Um, and Git, obviously, uh, and, and GitHub to, to public everything. Um, all the scripts, all the modules that uh, I'm working on. Um, 
just like Meryl said uh, uh, the, the episode before uh, this one, um, he goes into great detail on, on talking on uh, about how putting pub uh, putting stuff public um, to the open is a very good thing to do uh, f- to increase your your knowledge in in particular uh, in particular areas. And, and I just uh, can't emphasize that enough. But it's uh, uh, to me, it's been very helpful um, uh, to reach out to, to my uh, few Twitter followers and uh, get some uh, super professional and uh, sharp advice on how to do things faster, how to do things uh, in a better way, more efficient. And that's what it's all about. I mean, uh, we're, we're partial people, so we, we like to automate things and doing it more efficiently. I mean, yeah, what's not to like? So, and I know, especially when it comes to Microsoft Docs, uh, Sean, Sean Willer's done talks where he talks about the tools he uses specifically to make the docs easier. So, I mean, yeah. the, the, all, all the tools to make a lot of it, the, the barrier to entry lower are there and talked about. So it's... Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's the nice thing with working with a, um, uh, a repository that it's, you know, it's been built up from PowerShell people. So there's a lot of tools around it and uh, yeah it's just uh it's very thought out as well with uh, uh, all the uh, documentation around contributing um i think uh, it's uh, um yeah just goes to goes to see how how many contributors that repository uh, has and uh, we're doing an awesome uh, job at it and shout um, out mikey like you said mikey's awesome yes yes <laughs> Sean Wheeler also, but yeah, it's been cool to see Mikey join the team and kick things up. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Mike helped me a lot with, uh, or Mike helped me a lot with uh, uh, Git and uh, doing some more advanced things in Git, uh, like rebasing and uh, creating a, a a PR that's actually acceptable, you know, for um, you know, not 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 the PR that has uh, you know ten commits where. Uh, where the, the commits messages are all unstructured. So, uh, um, yeah. On, on that note, I would also like to plug uh, Michael Lombardi's uh, um, Git repository, that has, uh, which is which is called. Uh, I think it's called "Getting Started with Git" or "Getting Getting Git." I think it's called. Um, it's a super, uh, you know, educational repository that you can just fork, uh, clone, and basically read the README. And it's uh, um, you can do some interactive uh, Git command lining. And um, yeah, getting GitHub is the name of it. Link in show yeah, notes. Yeah, yeah. And that is a very uh, you know good resource of if you like interactive kind of learning. I do. Um, Nice. Yes, Co- Coen, so I think uh, as well. Yeah, I was about to mention that. That's a great one as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's also like an interactive way of learning. And it's, um, you know, I, I come from a background of playing a lot of video games and uh, just gamifying and having interactive ways of doing stuff is, you know, very fortunate. Uh, Last time we had Mike in as a guest, we learned that he is a, a different animal, where his full-time job is documenting Microsoft Docs. And then he found a, a repo, something he liked, where the documentation wasn't good enough. And he just made it like his, his passion project to then, basically, he extended his job out just to add, add more documentation. That guy, <laughs> he's a beast. If you're, if you're looking for how yes. to properly do documentation and get everything submitted, that, that's that's the source. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, yeah. he's a community star, let's just say that. <laughs> For sure. It's cool to see him end up on the PowerShell team and look to him to join us on the pod in the coming weeks. I don't have an exact date, but we'll be talking to him here soon enough. Awesome. <laughs> Now you mentioned PS Coons, and I don't I don't want to just mention it in passing because I think it deserves a full mm-hmm. call out. We yeah, have mentioned awesome. it a few times before, but what is PS Coons? You kind of mentioned it's used to learn PowerShell, but and as an interactive way, what is it? I mean, uh, it's a uh, it's a module, PowerShell module, to begin with. Um, you just uh, install it, install module, PS Coins, 
And uh, there's some documentation on how to uh, get going. But there's a couple of commands that you uh, uh, you call, and uh, you will get back a uh, couple of instructions on what you should do. So you get a couple of files that you should edit, and uh, the instruction will uh, tell you that uh, uh, you are stuck on this line. Please fix it. And uh, you go into uh, your editor of choice, edit the line, and you call the command again. And uh, either you have passed or you have not passed. And you learn a thing or two by not passing. Um, so uh, yeah, highly recommend it. It's uh, an easy install. Um, I think it's uh, I mean it's fully open source and community driven as well. So definitely check out the repository, give it a star, um, download the module, and uh, have fun. Yeah, and share it with people who are new to PowerShell as well. For yeah. some people, this is their heavily preferred method of, of learning things and it kind of lays it out for them and they're also solving problems as they go like they're literally resolving errors that they're getting from pester it's kind of a good way to learn pester too even if you already are really familiar with what you need to know in powershell in terms of commands and that type of stuff that's uh unique to powershell well you can still learn unit testing and i gotta add there's some nice theming to it you know it, it isn't just boring unit tests there's some kind of zen meditation yeah, yeah. type stuff that adds a little bit of story to it sort of kind of keeps yeah, you definitely. engaged you're starting your journey and yeah, yeah. i can't can't believe that i was presenting uh, these koans without saying that it's a uh, pester unit that's mm -hmm. that you're actually uh, fixing but uh, uh yeah that's obviously the case um yeah, i think yeah. you need a, a specific version of a pester pester 5 i think is the minimum version uh but yeah it's uh I I don't think you have to worry that if you don't know that much about Pester, you don't have to uh, think that uh, you need to know Pester uh, to get started with PS Collins. Um because the basics you will be taught by the module itself. And that's what's what's uh, making this a very good choice for for uh, for learning. Hmm. It makes me think if I should do like a lunch and learn PS koans where I kind of get it, set it up, mm -hmm. run it kind of for a group. Obviously, I could answer all of it myself, but kind of yeah. engaging, break down that barrier and, and get some people started with it at least. Yes, there was back in the day, uh, I think Don Jones created a couple of documents. Uh, that uh, Power uh, Sapien Technologies hosted, which were also very interactive. Um, let me see if I can find them. We'll put them in the show notes. Um, basically, it's a couple of PDFs from, from Sapien that are, are um, uh, written um, kind of interactively. So you should read them, have a PowerShell uh, prompt uh, at your one screen uh, and the PDF on another, and then uh, you uh, uh, read the instructions and go uh, through a lot of labbing. So if you're into that kind of learning, then I can highly recommend uh, the Sapiens technology. Uh, PowerShell PDFs. Uh, nice. I think Jeff Hicks also has a similar mm -hmm. type of project-based thing. And I think Doug does as well, tiny PowerShell projects. So mm -hmm. some good stuff there. And uh, if you want to keep track of any sort of PowerShell events that I'm hosting, join us in the PDQ Discord, in particular the PowerShell scripting channel. Uh, discord.gg slash pdq and we can see you there um, also worth noting that the powershell community has its own amazing discord aka.ms slash ps discord um, you'll find the bulk of powershell users in there um, a lot of good conversation there as well so good chance for people to get engaged yeah definitely they're very, very fast with helping out uh, in the powershell discord so oh yeah uh and while we're on the subject of amazing blogs written by you, which we sort of were before we pivoted a little bit, but let's get back to it. So we talked to Meryl, who does some Azure Entra stuff, and you have a blog about, what is it, sending mail with uh, Azure Automation? Uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, it, it's uh, it's a blog post about uh, say using the command that send mg user mail. Um, which is a way of using the Microsoft Graph in PowerShell to send emails. And since the legacy commandlet, or, or the built-in commandlet rather, uh, 
can't remember what it's called. Send a mail message, I think, in PowerShell. Yeah. Uh, it even has a warning now when, when you're sending mails with it, telling you that it's unsecure. You want to migrate it to um, to a to a more modern and, and secure way. And one of those uh, ways could be to use send mg user mail. Uh, and I have a post where I go in on how you could set up um, an Azure automation account and a uh, app registration in Azure and delegate some permissions to it and uh, yeah, set up uh, autom automatic emailing. Um, I did this myself the, uh, the other week where I uh, went into Active Directory and did some LDAP queries and then I was storing data in a PS uh, custom objects and then I was uh, creating a CSV file and uh, the CSV was very large. So I ended up uh, compressing it to a zip file and then I sent the email using um, uh, Microsoft Graph and Azure Automation. So it's one way of doing things and uh, yeah, so it's fast as well and uh, not so hard to get into. One, one thing I was looking at is mm -hmm. you specified your from as it was like a no reply from, from Contoso. So, so when yeah. you when you were setting up this, does it have like a email address associated with the account that you're using to sign in, or are you just basically making one up on the fly and having it pretend to be it for the send? No. So with the old uh, send mail message, you could basically spoof any email. Uh, it didn't really matter what you were doing uh, as long as the um, S, uh, SMTP server were, were allowing you through. Basically, so you would have access. You can spoof anything. This you can't do on on uh, send mg uh, user mail. Uh, so you'll have to have a, a email that you have access on sending on behalf to. Um, so what you are doing. So what I ended up doing was I created a shared mailbox in Exchange Online, and uh, then this shared mailbox I named uh, something uh, descriptive for me and my team. So uh, we would have a, a team name dot uh, no reply uh, UPN. And uh, then you set the permission in the app registration. So uh, and you, I don't, I think you can do it uh, with less privilege than I describe in this uh, blog post. But what I ended up doing was creating um, an app registration with uh, uh, send mail API. Yeah. I, I most. imagine you can get away with as light as just having given the account send as permissions to that mailbox, since yeah, you're yeah. probably not pr probably not connecting to the ten with the same thing you would be accessing the mailbox. The send as should be enough, but. Mm -hmm. I mean, this this thing is pretty secure anyhow because you're you are configuring it with uh, either a enterprise certificate or a, a secret that will be encrypted. The blog goes into um, great detail on how you create an encrypted uh, um, client secret and uh, you use it in in your automation and calling it with uh, an internal command that can only be used by Azure Automation. Um, yeah, Azure Automation is, is a, a beast in itself, but uh, it's a, a very straightforward tool to get into if you're coming from a, an IT background where you have done a lot of you know, scheduled tasking and stuff like that. So now that I think about it, I should do a blog post about that. <laughs> but, uh, now you don't have to remember it. You can just refer to your blog post in the future. Exactly. Nice. Oh my gosh. And so that concludes your blog post and there's many other great ones on your website um and it looks like you have uh, one of those websites that we'd love to see in the community which is the hugo markdown uh, i imagine it's hosted on github as well is that what we got yeah. here yeah yeah kind of I, i'm hosting it on netify at the moment uh, i wanted to try it out and uh yeah it's working very good um yeah I, I, I have a blog because I want to document things for myself mainly, but also to share with uh, anyone who might stumble across it um, as well. Um, every time I, I, I solve something in, in, in my work and there's like, I wish I found an article about this. I usually just create one myself and, um, you know, in the high hopes of, to, to help anyone. Um, yeah, at least help you. Yeah. Guaranteed one. 
it's it's kind of funny when you start blogging uh, and after a while you've uh, you've created blog articles that you forget or at least i do so i i i, I usually forget that oh yeah i i actually wrote a whole uh, blog post about this um i did that with I did a blog post about how you can install a PFX certificates. So you, you would have a, a, a public and private key certificate uh, in a PFX format uh, on an ADFS server, and you would install it on all your other, the whole ADFS farm, basically. And I had to do this. Uh, I mean, uh, I work. <laughs> we haven't really introduced me, I guess, but I, I work as an Active Directory um, engineer or subject matter expert. Uh, although I don't consider myself an expert as an expert, but uh, yeah, and then uh, working with ADFS, you you uh, need to renew you know public certificates uh, every year, uh, and uh, yeah, I wrote a blog post about it. You can find it on uh, uh, on my blog. It's called uh, Partial Solutions Install PFX Certificate on Servers, and. Uh, goes into detail on how um, you could, uh, if you have a PFX certificate that you bought from an external vendor, how you can install it on all your servers. So have you run into yet where you Google to find out how to do something and you stumble upon your own work? No, no, I have not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm too poorly indexed on, uh, uh, on the search engines because I changed uh, um, I actually changed website name because I bought another domain. So I, my my blog was uh, emis uh, .tech before, uh, but I I, I wanted to um, change it up to uh, represent my <laughs> uh, where I'm from uh, a bit more. So I changed it to se and uh, yeah, so, that I think that broke the indexing a bit. So clever. Internet users know where you're from from the .se, but where are you from? I'm from Sweden, so uh, I live in uh, outside of Linköping, Sweden, which is uh, basically in the, in the southern parts. Uh, yeah, born and uh, raised here, and uh, I've been working with IT uh, for. I sound uh, kind of old now, I guess, but I, I think I've been working with IT for uh, ten years, something. Uh, started working in 2012, um, kind of as an on-site um, on um, support technician, uh, reinstalling uh, clients. Then I, I moved up to a second line <clears throat> support role where I did a lot of um, uh, support via, via the phone. And uh, that was also in a, in a migration project where we migrated Windows XP to Windows 7. And uh, me too. <laughs> that's where it all started. And I remember uh, back in the day when we had our first introduction to that job at some, you know, meetings with uh, technical fellows, and uh, they were explaining to us how how we can solve solve some uh, some stuff. And that domain or that uh, environment had a lot of Unix uh, clients. So in comes this Unix person who is kind of, you know, highly respectable, uh, I guess, in the company. Uh, and uh, at the other side of the table sits the Windows guys. And they, they uh, and in the middle of the table, we new people sit. And we, we're kind of, you know, just observing what's happening. And they have kind of, a, you know, that they're all <laughs> the ancient Windows versus Linux or Unix uh, debate. And then this Unix guy says basically, yeah, you have one good thing in Windows, and that's uh, the new PowerShell thing that is uh, coming up. And I just remember I was thinking, I'm going to learn this you know, this tool because if this guy says it's the only good thing with Windows, then uh, you know, might as well stick to it. So, uh, so a, yeah. a turning point in your career was a throwaway <laughs> line from a, yeah, from a Linux admin. I guess I guess it wasn't even a turning point, but <laughs> you say it like that, it was basically the start of it, uh, rather. Uh, yeah, after that, a couple of months uh, later, I, I ended up watching. You know, you, you guys have been telling, uh, you know, talking a lot about it, but uh, Jeffrey Snower and uh, Jason Hamlick with the you know Jumpstart PowerShell, and I think I think Jeffrey says 
somewhere in in that uh, kind of long course that just force yourself to do stuff in the shell. You know, just stick to it. Um, even if you have a task that you know you can do manually in one, two, uh, five minutes, just do it in the shell instead. You get more comfortable and uh, you get some experience with it. And I, I took that to heart and uh, it was a very good timing because in, in Windows 7 and the environment I was in, like uh, WinRM was enabled on all the clients and uh, partial remote thing was you know, enabled by policy. And um, they used also AppV uh, for, for some application packaging uh, and, and provisioning. So you could do a lot of uh, you know support cases with uh, the app V module. Uh, they were using Citrix as well, and I remember Citrix had these self-service binaries. You know, if you installed Citrix receiver, you would have uh, some sort of cleanup binary that you can just call from PowerShell remotely, and it would basically clear you know some some cached data for the user. I sold a lot of tickets, I can say, with uh, just doing some PowerShell remoting uh, uh, magic. And uh, yeah, it was uh, kind of a fun thing. Then I stumbled into Active Directory because uh, the Active Directory module is uh, you know, very PowerShell friendly. You can do uh, basically everything in AD using PowerShell or, or LDAP queries or ANSI search or what have you. And uh, yeah, just... Uh, um, kind of went from there. A um, couple of years later, I think uh, this whole identity and access management wave were, were sweeping over uh, uh, the industry. And I ended up in, uh, if you're from an AD background, you, you manage identities. And now you're all of a sudden in the identity and access management team. So that's where I've been since uh, 2016. Uh, so I've been working with identity and access management in, in hybrid environments um, ever since and been doing a lot with, uh, uh, you know, the Active Directory modules, DNS modules, uh, uh, PKI modules, um, DHCP. I've uh, been doing a lot with Microsoft Graph and uh, uh, Azure AD uh, or Entra AD. And uh, yeah. Busy. It's That's cool to hear. <laughs> I, I think that we're about the same age because I think we started in IT at a similar yeah, time. Yeah. I got started to do the same XP to Windows 7 thing, yeah. uh, taking care of a big mess. <laughs> for That's, an all, That's awesome. Yeah. I was <laughs> in exactly the same scenario. Right? It was a total mess. Uh, and I mean, <laughs> that the old domain was just fill, filled with clients that were like, I mean, older than, than Windows 2000. And, and they ended up I mean, in my scenario, I, I'm all ears to hearing yours as well. But in my scenario, they also they didn't even they didn't only stop at migrating the client from Windows XP to Windows Seven. They also created a completely new domain and migrated, you know, everything that was above Windows Server. I think 2008 and uh, so, uh, all OSs that was above, you know, Windows Seven was migrated to this new domain and. Uh, it seems common, but uh, yeah, how was your um, AD, I mean, how was your uh, migration project? It's always it was, fun to hear. I'll be honest, um, they didn't have very good IT practices back then at this no. uh, particular place, maybe, maybe not. I guess things were different. We can say, well, excuse yeah, the yeah. times. Um, but <laughs> yeah, we were using a manual process for a lot of it. And I was mm -hmm. like, wait, this doesn't make sense. Why are we doing things super manually? So I implemented some MDT. I mean, like we were using Ghost to manually like write a hard drive, uh, back up all their stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like a terrible clunky process with USB sticks and all that. <laughs> so we did yep. some MDT stuff by the end of it. And it was nice. They eventually, I was actually an intern. So after that whole little project, they hired me and then I left them. <laughs> okay. To do more so you got a, yeah, you got a lot of uh, experience in the process, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. was the thing is, though, uh, you know, I was working in a smallish town where yeah. like most of the places where you can work, they aren't doing everything best practice necessarily. Right. They're doing things mm -hmm. the best they can, but nobody really is coming in with that. I don't know how to explain it. Maybe a Microsoft MVP level of like, oh, hey, here's what's accepted. Mm -hmm. Here's what's recommended. Let's do everything yeah. the right way. It's like, yeah, yeah. you know. 
I think not there's unempowered more... IT. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I think there's more jumps, by the way, between you know the, the local people that, that don't even follow best practices and, and the Microsoft MVPs. There's a lot of uh, gray zone there. I have experienced at least. And, and uh, yeah, I think it's come down to, to leadership, how much you want to trust your, your IT uh, personnel. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Did you uh, dabble in... Uh, completely random question i guess but from from that time i remember i was very I interested and, and hooked on uh, troubleshooting packs in powershell have you ever heard of it or, or, or dabbled in it nothing's coming to mind yeah I mean, it sounds like a little bit familiar but no i don't believe yeah so. it's, what's, what's it's, that? It, it's kind of funny if you're in a support organization because you could I remember, I'm not sure if this is used at all anymore, but you, you know, if, if you have issues with your sound, basically, if, if, you're, if your sound um, uh, device is disabled or your network device is disabled, you will get a pop out in Windows saying like, uh, you know, prior to this issue. It? For yeah. me. Exactly. Yeah. And that little thing is a troubleshooting pack going <laughs> behind the scenes. And you could create your own troubleshooting packs. Uh, and send them out remotely to to basically fix stuff under the hood. Uh, I was dabbling a bit uh, with this when I when I was working in support, and I just think you know the concept is uh, it's kind of funny, but uh, I am not sure that uh, I've seen a lot of people using it. It's this old gem from the past. <laughs> yeah, haven't seen that. But then we got into PowerShell, and things have been good since. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it is a PowerShell kind of. I'm not sure if it's a module. There's a couple of built-in commandlets, so you create your own. Uh, I think it's XML-based or or uh, something like that. Yeah, it's an XML schema, I think, uh, and you create your own uh, XML file and and you pass it to the Invoke Troubleshooting Pack commandlet, and uh, you can have it running on remote servers to fix, you know, resolution issues or sound issues or networks issues. Um, I'm not sure of the functionality. I think I just did the because there are some default uh, built-in packs, so to say, uh, that you can use that Windows uses, so like sound and stuff like that, and network. And um, uh, I think there are some with uh, file sizes and stuff like that. I think I just did the built-in ones, and I mean they worked, but. <laughs> Uh, do you think yeah. it is way different now than it was maybe 10 years ago like yeah has automation really become forefront for most organizations like everyone's coming into it knowing that that automation is a thing or is it still yeah. uh, so i can only talk from my perspective and it it varies so much from organization to organization um but there are definitely more I think people or managers now that expect you to automate stuff. And back in, I think there was some golden age, at least for me, but like between 2013 and maybe 15, like people didn't expect you at all to automate anything. And if you did, like I, you could just spend like one, two, three hours creating a process. And then people would expect it to take you a week to actually do it, you know, like, yeah. can, can you add this uh, 150 people to these 480 groups? I was like, yeah, it's done. <laughs> and, and people were like, okay, but <laughs> so, why did it take this guy over here like two weeks to do this? <laughs> you did it in four minutes. Uh, that's, uh, you know. I, I, people expect you to to do those kind of tasks faster now, but I think there's another level of um, coding admins that are basically uh, you know regular sys admins, but they could take a developer job like just as easily because they knew no Git, they know Markdown, they know uh, version control, they know some CI/CD, you know, basic concepts and. Um, you know, they, they are super good at learning. Don Jones talk about learning muscles a lot. Like you need to train your learning muscle and, and, and get something in daily. Yeah, and I, I really, you know, trust that by heart. That uh, for, for, for me at least, this has worked very good. Um, 
you know, practice learning and you can basically just jump into anything and just learn it in a couple of hours and then you'll be very mm -hmm. sharp at it. Um, and you're comfortable with it. Yep. So it, yeah. It makes sense that the landscape has changed just because a business decision on a grand scale is almost always going to be driven by money. And yeah. Aut automation saves so many labor hours that it's almost financially irresponsible to not at least look into it. So it, yeah. it makes sense it's taken off. I still think it's going to be more over the years. I think they're kind of in the middle ground right now, but I think more mature IT shops, it's becoming pretty mandatory. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I'm also a bit, I'm not sure if I'm worried, but the trend is kind of going more and more. And I, it's, it's something that you and my background, Andre, kind of has this, you know, working with PowerShell commandlets, they are, um, from Microsoft, they are signed, they are in a, in a DLL file, they are, you know, compiled, they're very fast, responsive. The APIs are, are, are blazingly fast and what you get back is an object, you know, uh, you can you can do stuff with objects that methods, it just, it just basically works very good. And uh, I'm not sure that, uh, that I enjoy, you know, working that much with Microsoft Graph kind of commandlets. Um, like I do, like I did with uh, with the old legacy stuff that you can still work with a lot, obviously. Um, that's a trend that I've been seeing, especially with uh, Microsoft Graph. Uh, that it doesn't really support, you know, pipelining. It doesn't really, I mean, it has a whole different architectural background, right? Uh, using REST APIs instead. Of, and uh, I mean, that's something that you just have to, suck up and deal with i guess uh, because you're living in a cloud future but uh, personally I, I i just love this you know c sharp compiled module that is just very optimized and uh, powershell uh, you know friendly where you have good help documentation and uh, a lot of advanced param parameters and stuff like that well so we were going through the pre-show, and I think we're technically still in the pre-show because I got a couple more, <laughs> a couple more blogs. Blog. <laughs> so next up, <laughs> these are recommendations straight from Emil of some resources that he wanted to give an extra little spotlight on, um, and we'll start off with Pipe How. What is this? Uh, Pipe How is a wonderful blog by a fellow Swede named Emmanuel Palm. And um, uh, I can't recommend this blog enough because he goes in and he does some heavy lifting in terms of uh, blogging. Um, if you're interested in um, PowerShell.net, Azure, and you want to know how this stuff really works um, behind the scenes and how the protocols work, and how to do things in a very uh, advanced way, to say. Uh, read this uh, website, type.how. Um, there's a couple of good uh, articles, uh, and uh, one of uh, them is, uh, he did an article on hash tables. It's called Partial Collections Hash Table. And it goes into great detail on how you can work with hash tables and basically manipulate and uh, configure any kind of uh, table to uh, do your bidding in PowerShell. And uh, yeah, can't recommend it enough. Uh, needs more traction. <laughs> I like that one because the very top of the blog is he builds the table of contents for what's in the blog into a hash table. Exactly. That's fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, the, the theming of the blog is also wonderful. Uh, and the information as well, obviously. Um, I like it. Yeah. Awesome. So pipe.how, clever name as well. And there's one more blog we want to highlight. And this is from friend of the podcast, guest on the podcast, Bjorn Sundling. So what do we have here? Uh, yeah, so uh, another fellow Swede, coincidence, actually, uh, it's not that I only read Swedish blogs, I promise, uh, but uh, Bjumpen is uh, a very active uh, PowerShell star, and I mean, I read a lot of his uh, blogs because 
I try to learn from the best. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, just check out his blog, beyondpun.com. Um, in particular, we were talking about an, an article he wrote on, on uh, the value of uh, uh, certifications. And uh, this is not so much technical, but has more to do with um, how you should, you know, should you take a certificate or not? And uh, uh, Microsoft wants you to take one, obviously, but uh, should you? <laughs> and I think this is kind of a nuanced picture of, uh, e, um, you know, re, uh, re, read the blog post is called uh, a follow up on the concept of certificates and uh, decide for yourself uh, if you want to or not. Uh, Bjompen seems to enjoy certificates. Uh, I kind of, I enjoy, so if I'm just going to talk personally about how I view certificates, and when we talk certificates, we're not we're not talking digital certificates, obviously, we're talking certifications, IT certifications. Uh, I mean, I, I usually do the training material, but I rarely take the actual, uh, you know, assignment or, or um, the, the certificate yeah. itself and, the and exam. because yeah exactly exactly the exam was what word i was looking for and it has more to do uh with i usually want to learn something that i'm very interested in and usually in a, a certificate like ac 800 for example i mean you, there are probably a role like that uh, in some companies but i don't have that role um it's basically work with Active Directory, uh, work with DFS, work with Hyper-V, work, work with, um, you know, uh, licensing in, in Azure. Uh, there's a lot of spread out things uh, there. That some bits are very helpful and some bits are very good to know. But uh, I personally haven't um, had the need to cert uh, feel the need to certify myself yet, but I mean that might change as well in the future. But, so uh, I, I think with those, it's very dependent on the cert itself, right? Like so, some of them show a deep value or a deep knowledge. Uh, Cisco for networking in particular, those are usually pretty good. At, if you have those, you know your stuff. I, right. I started doing the first AWS cert just for mm -hmm. giggles and. What I, what I learned is it's not testing if I know the material, it's testing if I know the name of their products. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the questions are, no. they're like, I went through their white pages to look up de definitions just because after taking some of their practice exams, mm -hmm. and they have 28 different machine learning services. And a lot of the questions are, which machine learning service does this or what does this one do? So it's, it's not so much, can, can I go into AWS and configure things, it's do I know what they no. named everything. I've heard that the later ones are more than that, but mm -hmm. the first the first search, I'm going to finish it because I'm far down the process, but I don't know yeah. how much value it actually shows. Yeah, yeah. And and if you're in, I mean, we're going to, let's not spoil everything in this blog post, but it, it, I think, uh, uh, Jordan, if you re you should also read this blog post, actually. And, uh, you know, decide for yourself is, is a good thing to, go, to do uh, going further. You might need it, you might not. So, um, so it is a launching pad. I, I, I do want to learn a lot more about yeah, cloud computing, both on mm -hmm. Azure and AWS side. And it is step one where there's mm -hmm. the other ones I understand are more. It's just I was a bit disappointed with the first version. It's, yeah. do, do you know what we named our S3 storage? Not Yeah, I can't I can imagine, yeah. And that's our pre-show. <laughs> <laughs> nice pre-show. Yeah. 50 minutes. <laughs> Awesome. So you yeah. we were talking about before we started recording, unfortunately, but back in the day, <laughs> the PowerShell scripting podcast, because mm -hmm. I was also listening to that. Yeah, um, it, it, probably the same times. I think it was like a monthly podcast, was it? Uh, yes. I mean, they were very sporadic. I felt like like sometimes they would have. I think they would have a conference or something. They would do maybe some something more frequently, but I think the schedule was monthly. Yeah, most likely. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, it's just so cool to have this community of people where there's still people who are new to it getting up. There's people who have been around for a while and have experienced it and are still living out the values that we've found to be helpful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, so I've, I've been an avid listener of, of the PowerShell Scripting podcast. And I mean, that 
that podcast has, I mean, done done a lot of good uh, and my knowledge based on PowerShell at least and and you know you need to you, you you get to listen to to some great minds and I really think you guys have done a great job um at that with this podcast as well uh, there's a lot of people here that's uh, you know you uh, as a fellow user of the tool um you you would never hear such in depth conversation with otherwise. So so kudos to you guys for 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 taking the torch up and uh, running the podcast. Hey, and thanks to you for joining us and being one of those <laughs> awesome worries. people that people listen to and relate to and learn from. And it's definitely yeah, yeah. helpful to get involved in in the community. And if you're listening to a podcast, to be able to use that as a way to sort of understand how are people talking about this stuff, how are they thinking about this stuff because I think so many people are kind of fighting battles without their whole organization or team support and trying to learn skills and bring people up to speed. And uh, you're not alone. There's a lot of us out there that really appreciate that work and, and what you're yeah. doing. So, Yeah, yeah. And I, there, there's a lot of people that probably work in roles where if they are PowerShell savvy and uh, have been, you know, learning a thing or two, they might even be, uh, you know, the, the, the sharpest uh, coding or IT brain in the room. And uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I just can imagine that there's a lot of people that, that feel like that and, and want to tune into something like uh, this podcast, for example, and uh, you know, get to listen to some, some great minds just uh, talk out. So yeah, it's uh, very cool. I, I had some follow follow up questions on, you know, how you guys creating this podcast because you know, you know I've been an avid fan of uh, uh, the PowerShell scripting podcasts and uh, probably listened to most of the episodes. Uh, I've listened to probably all the episodes of this podcast as, as well. And I was just curious like about, about the background that you guys have in, in creating podcasts in particular like was it just something you 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 took up that you saw a need for or or have you you know created podcasts before or so how is it i I never done a podcast uh our our boss his name's kelly hammer who's his entire life has been his entire career not his life because he's a fantastic well well-rounded person but his entire career has been around audio he did radio programming for a mm -hmm. long time and so now he's our boss and pdq loves powershell and we always like to do it so we on our live webcast on thursdays we talk about it intermittently in there but we wanted something powershell specific uh a few years ago we tried doing a live webcast where it was just all powershell and it didn't didn't take off and this was just the next idea but as far as all of the sound, all of the editing, all the behind the scenes work that makes it sound great, that's, that's just because we're lucky enough to have Kelly. I'll also say that back in the day before I worked at PDQ with Jordan, I would watch his stuff on YouTube that he was doing through the PDQ channel about PowerShell. Mm -hmm. um, he had blog posts and stuff. So I, I kind of, I even met him at PowerShell Summit one year. So that sort of played a role in things. And then eventually I got employed at PDQ and I was helping our customers. I was a solutions engineer, so helping our customers use our products well and any issues that they ran into. And I was pretty vocal about PowerShell internally and people internally are also like at PDQ, we know all about PowerShell. We love it. We've been talking about it for a long time. So it just kind of made sense. Um, there was like kind of a gap and no better way to pay it forward. Um, I didn't ever expect to be doing a podcast in my life, but you know, what better <laughs> podcast to do than a PowerShell one with some of the coolest people in the world. So it's been fun. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, it's super nice job. And um, yeah, I was just super curious about it because I, I don't think this is the first media that's a media form that you think of when you're, uh, you know, working as a IT pro or... Mm -hmm. The big concern pro. is if you're talking specific to PowerShell where we can't show yeah I it make, yeah. makes it a little bit more difficult uh we've thought about doing more video components and we've had a few episodes where mm -hmm. we experiment but i i think that most people just listen and yeah i think so as well um there is something there are a lot of a few podcasts i would say that uh, are more sysadmin or developer oriented but uh 
Um, there's just something nice to uh, to it uh, to uh, obviously listen to a lot of the the, the folks that have been very um, you know, good to the community uh, or important uh, persons in in the product's lifetime. And uh, like you had Bruce Payet on, uh, for example, just listen to him for for, <laughs> for an hour. Well, you know, I think a lot of people are interested in that. So. Uh, it's a, it's a good thing that you did it, and I'm, I'm super happy about it. <laughs> that one was. That. Can you believe we had Bruce pay on? I can't yeah, believe we no, no. did all these things now. <laughs> when I, exactly. I, I felt like he was trying to lower his level of speak to where I could understand. <laughs> it was like a struggle for him. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think so as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, trying to speak to us mortals. Um, <laughs> yeah. Jeez, that's intimidating. We've talked to a lot of people. Yeah, like, yeah. But yeah we find Wheeler on and uh, yeah, a lot of. I mean, this is, I just, just can't name drop here because there's too many. I've had many. you'd have so many good names on. And, um, yeah. How many have we done? I think we're coming up on ninety or so. Mm-hmm. So Jeez. I will say that it is kind of okay. nice that the later rounds of the podcast are, are basically a constant proving us right. Because the first couple, it was just the two of us talking about how much we love the community. Mm-hmm. And then we started reaching out and the community has been overwhelmingly supportive and jumping in and taking part. So it's it, it started off with just, we wanted to talk PowerShell and then yeah. we love the community and then the community proved us right and it turned into something new, which I think is fantastic. But it's a responsibility too, you know, <laughs> like we don't want to do, imagine if we did a bad job, we're kind of doing a disservice to the community that helps out so much. So yeah. it's... um very fortunate position to be in i guess but we take it pretty serious you're doing an awesome job uh both of you so you can don't have to think about that yeah i think it's like most good things you're tr- well at least for me a lot of what i do is try and make helpful stuff that i would have found useful before i learned it, or even still but like uh, man i wish i would have had that resource and, yeah, yeah. and you know powershell scripting podcast i listen to the heck out of it it helped me learn how to sort of think like more of these advanced users right I yeah. wasn't, you kind of sort of get to mentor with someone kind of learn how they think and approach problems and approach mm-hmm. communication and learning and all this stuff that's super important for your life and career yeah i think it's also valuable just uh listening to people saying the words out loud kind of um because if you're a, a if you're a lone sysadmin in a company where you are the only guy doing stuff, you're only reading documentation and you're only creating stuff for yourself. Maybe you've never even really talked about, you know, uh, parameters, variables, uh, uh, you know, strings, boleans, whatever have you, and just listening to some 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 um, experts talk about the the, uh, the subject can be, um, you know, you can learn a much uh, soft skills, I think, uh, from it, just talking a bit about it out loud. Yeah, you mentioned earlier um, about learning how you learn and things like that. And I mm-hmm. really love harping on that because that's a skill that is just going to pay value for the rest of your career. You want to be yeah. confident in your ability to learn things and comfortable with mm-hmm. how you learn things. But also communication is another one of those things where for the rest of your career, communication and learning are going to be huge constants no matter what the role is. Um, so doing things the right way, you know, we've mentioned it a lot here, but it's worth a call out. It is worth it to start blogging if you haven't yet. It is worth taking that first step. It is a career changer. It's a perspective changer. It changes the way you are able to now learn and engage with others and teach and new relationships that can form and new avenues for feedback on how you're approaching things. So if you're listening to this now and you haven't gotten started and you've kind of been wavering back and forth, take it from us here today and everyone that we've ever talked to about this subject. It is worth it to start getting blogging and sharing your solutions with the world and not just keeping them to yourself. Yeah, I uh, I agree a lot. Um, Myself, uh, started listening a bit to uh, uh, another podcast actually that was called Perspectives in Tech with uh, Josh Daphne and um, um, Don Jones. Um, and they talked a lot about you know being your own brand and uh, that's something that uh, Don Jones preaches a lot as well uh, in, in his book uh, Own Your Tech Career. Um, I am currently reading that book and it's uh, it's kind of eye-opening um, some of the stuff that he teaches in that book. So I, I, 
I guess I can't really recommend it yet because I haven't read it fully, but I'm currently reading it and it's a, a super nice book. Um, so Own Your Tech Career by um, Don Jones. Did you message me telling me about that? Because I think someone else told me they did if it wasn't you. Uh, I'm not I th- sure. Yeah, uh, you had uh, a person on the podcast and he was talking heavily about it. He's a, a, a community rock star that I'm not so familiar with. Um, Joe Hughes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Joe Hughes. I guess that's someone else that messaged me. I checked their DMs. It wasn't there. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> it's a Own Your Tech Career by Don Jones. Yeah. yeah. I've learned a lot from Don over the years. Yeah, I mean, uh, he's kind of the uh, one of the pioneering uh, community persons. Uh, and uh, I think the, the whole PowerShell community is very fortunate for, for that. Uh, he's created a lot of... A, a lot of uh, things that are still public uh, uh, in uh, in pub that you can get for a very uh, you don't even a lot, a lot of the ebooks that he has published or uh, you don't even have to pay for them you can just read them um, and there's a lot of books that he has written that you uh, should definitely pay for and read because they are very good um, learn powershell in a month of lunches is one that uh, everyone kind of talks to is a very good starting point and even if you have uh, been advanced in powershell and then you maybe have gone on a a different path doing something else you want to come back i think learn powershell in a month of lunches is still a a very good read especially the new editions um, for partial cross-platform powershell um, and yeah, uh, I was talking earlier a bit about uh, Josh, Duff, uh, Josh Duffney's uh, uh, podcast that was called Perspective in Tech. They have not that many episodes, but one episode they go in. They, it, they are kind of short, these podcasts. So if uh, anyone um, finds that audio media is better to, to learn about uh, some soft skills, I can uh, recommend that podcast. Um, awesome. Yeah. Well, Jordan, I think he's done pretty good answering our questions so far. Right. But I think they need some hard hitters now. Some I, hard hitters. Not. I, I can think of three questions that would really mm-hmm. they stump, they stump most people. Three? Oh uh-huh. my gosh, I only thought of two. Are you ready for the, the common parameters, Emil? Uh, I don't think I can, but shoot. All right. Well, I mean, all you can do is try your best, right? It's That's the nice thing about the PowerShell community is as long as you try and everyone's happy. Yeah, exactly. Right. First. Common parameter. What's one time something went wrong while on the job, and uh, what did you learn from it? Uh, yeah, that's a funny question. I've done a lot of things that have went wrong. <laughs> Let's just say that. Uh, but one thing in particular, I think I did when I was uh, so. So, I, I mean, an 80, I'm an eighty guy, uh, right? So naturally, I've been working with dns a lot and working with dns and active directory then you naturally have worked with uh, uh, ddns and uh, if you work with ddns you have worked with dhcp and i have done that Uh, i have also worked for a company that has a lot of airports in sweden so uh, uh, i once had a ticket i remember uh, from uh, while working at this company Uh, the network department wanted to specifically remove everything uh, in a DHCP uh, server, uh, every, uh, basically every DHCP scope uh, that was in a DHCP server. And they said they wanted to remove uh, everything except this list that they sent me. And I had a script that would take a CSV file, which they sent, and a name, and it would just remove their, their exclusion list. Uh, and what I learned by that was you can automate a lot of things and uh, by doing so, your work will be very fast. And you need, if you do that, you need to confirm uh, once or twice before you're running your stuff. And you don't need to confirm it with yourself because you can do that with tester tests and you can do that with code. You need to confirm with the requester what you're actually doing because it wasn't that obvious that this was an exclusion list <laughs> to my sense. <laughs> but uh, I, I basically made 
uh, Landwetter, which is the biggest uh, airport in uh, in the second biggest country uh, city in Sweden, Gothenburg. Uh, yeah, completely still for an hour, I think, and uh, that kind of sucked. But, uh, <laughs> You look at it this uh, wrong way. That's the kind of wind that a hacker would brag about. That's that's a that's a resume building. Yeah, good DOS. Good DOS. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I kind of panicked. Um, but uh, I mean, uh, luckily for me, I had a log file as well, so I could just take my log file, parse it, and then reverse run it uh, instead of remove the HTTP scope. I would create uh, or new the HTTP scope. So so kind of worked out good anyway. All right, well, I mean, yeah. the nice thing about automation is it does exactly what you tell it to, but that is also uh, the, exactly. that's the downside. Exactly. <laughs> All right. First one's in the books. You did well. You crushed it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, see, the second common parameter, with everything you know now, all your extensive knowledge, what's one bit of advice you'd give your younger self when you first started in IT? Um, I think I would tell myself that it's okay to think a bit differently than other people do and everyone every human's brain is different and uh, some people have a hard time with uh, other things that other people have a really easy time with and um, yeah just uh, try, try to uh, take it uh, maybe not take it uh, or yeah take advantage of that uh, People are different, and uh, uh, yeah, learn from it, and don't be too harsh on yourself. Um, I think that's what I would tell myself. Obviously, uh, in, in IT, there's a lot of people that are struggling with the imposter syndrome as well, and uh, I would just—I I think a good, not cure, but or actually cure to imposter syndrome is just. Uh, kind of get into what it is and also just realize that basically in, I don't have the numbers but I would imagine like 95% of sysadmins and developers and, and people alike uh, you know have some form of imposter syndrome uh, uh, read a book on it and uh, yeah uh, you will feel better uh, that's what I would tell me uh, yeah. re re read a book on it is that's fantastic <laughs> advice. That's usually my uh, take on uh, you know learning something. Uh, no, I think that's good. I think it's important uh, to be honest with yourself, mm -hmm. like and ought to give yourself the space to ask questions and be honest with the people you're working with on projects. And yeah. like you said earlier, everyone thinks differently, and it's great to get other people's perspectives. But the same thing applies to you. It's great to get your perspective. It's not always helpful to ask the number one expert about X topic. It's helpful to ask different people who maybe aren't the premier expert and get their feedback. It, it leads to better solutions and smart teams know that. Um, so I hope you work on a smart team that's kind. It's the it's common same diversity to strength. Having someone think different isn't a negative. You just need to learn, especially because no, no one is the, the all perfect learner or arbiter of yeah. information. So having different uh, approaches is always a value add yeah yeah and what you said said just now jordan i think a lot of people need to or i would have need to been thinking about that earlier in my career there is not one single guy that knows everything um you know you specialize in in some things that you are interested in and uh, you know everyone knows different stuff and uh, don't stress so much about it uh, I think that's good advice. All right, are you ready for your last common parameter? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Right. Including Piet Hangman, the greatest module of all time. <laughs> what are your three favorite modules? Uh, well, it's not Piet Hangman, let's just say that. Uh, it's uh... <laughs> Piet Hangman was this funny module that I created a, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, it was basically an uh, interactive hangman game. Uh, install, install module, PS Hangman, have fun. Uh, I'm not so proud of that module, but uh, 
there, uh, I use a lot of modules. So this question is very hard. Peace read line. Uh, I, I'm not going to say peace read line. Uh, everyone says peace read line. Obviously, I love peace read line. Um, I mean, yeah, it's it is a module, but it feels more like peace read line is PowerShell, you know. Um, yeah, uh, but I mean, if if you see it just as a module, I mean, it's it's magic. Um, but otherwise, like my other three uh, favorites uh, would be since I'm an AD guy, I work a lot with uh, uh, delegations, and uh, I work a lot with Active Directory OU and uh, uh, yeah OU delegations. And there's not really a super good way of doing uh, OU delegations in PowerShell. You have to use get ACL, set ACL. You have to build like a, a, a an object, uh, and there's a you need like some some uh, grid mapping uh, helper functions to even do that. Uh, luckily, there's this uh, genius uh, Simon Valin that created uh, DSACL, so you can install it, uh, install module DSACL, and there's a, a PowerShell repository as well, Simon Valin DSACL, and it's a very PowerShell e way to do uh, Active Directory delegations or any. Uh, kind of ACL management in, in Active Directory. Uh, so I can't stress that enough if you're working with AD uh, or in security as well, uh, because you can obviously, um, you know, protect objects in, in AD by, by uh, manipulating uh, their access control list. Um, and if, if you're into PowerShell, just, uh, yeah, look it up. It's uh, very easy to use. Uh, my second module would be, uh, since I'm a key pass user, uh, have been since I think uh, basically forever, uh, Justin Grody's uh, secret management key pass module, I use daily and it's a very good module. Uh, uh, secret management overall is uh, such an amazing system, but uh, yeah. The, the keepers module works as you would expect it to to work, and uh, it does a fantastic job with uh, the uh, keepers database files. And um, yeah, I use it daily to fetch uh, passwords and and secrets uh, from my encrypted uh, keepers database and and get them in my hey, clipboard. I have a blog post on how I actually get I created some helper functions around that. How you can set up uh, um, your your uh, keep us database and uh, using uh, 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 secret management to set uh, the password in your clipboard and then clear it after I think it's 20 seconds or something like that. Um, uh, my blog post on the topic is called PowerShell Key Pass and Saving Time, which is on my blog. Uh, and yeah, uh, Justin is also a, a rock star. There's a lot of community persons that's uh, just. Uh, so that we talked about earlier, you can't really have, you know, think that you know something uh, here because there's always someone that will have greater experience. I, I was kind of, uh, let me rephrase that. Uh, I said before that there's a lot of people that has different skills than you. And the differences in their skills is also uh, allowing a lot of people to have a great, great depth in that skill. Uh, and I just feel like with the PowerShell community, it's just such a super nice example. Like there's a lot of people that are just so, you know, good at the things they are specializing in. Um, and I think that's really an asset. Um, nice. Yeah. And um, so yeah, secret management, keep us, uh, go at it if you're a keep us user. Uh, I think my third module would be Z. Uh, it's just called Z. Uh, a, 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 uh, you can do install module uh, and Z. So just the letter uh, Z? Yeah, exactly. Okay. The letter Z. And uh, it's basically what it does. I think this is very common on uh, Unix and Linux systems. I think there's a binary that's called uh, Z or, or uh, yeah. It's even forked from, I think, uh, a, a bash uh, repository. 
I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, what, it, what it allows you to do is jump around uh, directory paths uh, with like a very efficient way. So it replaces you CDing into, you know, um, uh, you know, C user uh, app data local wherever you want to go. Uh, it's it has a, a small database under hood or a config file that uh, builds when you're using it. So the more you're using it, the more it's going to, you know, uh, know your patterns. So you can, one thing I usually do is that I have a Git uh, folder and I have a lot of repositories in that Git folder. And I can just use said and then the repository name to jump around. I don't have to do cd dot dot slash cd dot dot slash and then go to, you know, my, my other repository. I can just said, uh, you know, whatever repo I want, hit enter or ta it supports tab completion as well. So, uh, yeah, and it's one of these things, the more you use it, the, the, the better it will be. So nice. That's uh, a great suggestion. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely to check it out. So it saves a lot of time. Uh, I just realized I also have a blog post on, on using this. <laughs> that's kind of funny. And that's uh, where uh, starting a blog helps. You got you yeah. got something relevant for every situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like a parrot <laughs> here. I'm just talking about my own blog, which is kind of funny. Uh, hey, if it's I a record mean... of what you've done, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of is. Uh, you, you I stopped... usually try to. Yeah, sorry. I was going to say, if you stop writing relevant blogs, you'll stop uh, having links to everything we're talking about. So it's exactly. on you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's uh, my three favorites. I have a lot of other modules that I use. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I preach. I'm not sure it's visible, but on my GitHub account, uh, my stars, but the, the the stars I have done uh, to other repositories, I have some lists there. I'm not sure if they are actually visible to other users or if it's just me. Uh, but anyhow, my my I, I usually star all you know modules that I have used, and I have a list that are that I call used modules, um, and I have another list that I call to be tested, which I add if I see a repository in GitHub that is an interesting PowerShell, uh, you know, community-driven uh, repository. Then I usually add it to to be tested, and then I test it, and then uh, see if it's you know I can have. Uh, and you you actually have a, a collection of your three favorites. Right yes, 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 <laughs> yes. This is heavily inspired by uh, <laughs> the common parameters from the PowerShell blog as a podcast. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I can highly recommend. Uh, I mean, now I sound kind of cocky, I guess, but <laughs> I highly recommend my my GitHub. Uh, I can recommend checking out my my GitHub lists to to see some uh, other PowerShell modules if you're interested. Um, nice. Well, as a long time listener, you probably are aware that you have been in the presence of a a legend, a celebrity. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is, I've tried to talk up how good Andrew is at showing a podcast, but I've been getting hate mail. Mm -hmm. I got I got a message the other day that says, I was ready for the second golden age of eloquence, I, but I was not ready for Andrew Plaus Schilling. And, and the fact of the matter is, it transcends language, or at least the English language. So I can't give it all of its due respect, but I can say everyone is in for a treat. Take it away, Andrew. Jordan, fitting intro. Thank you, sir. Beloved listeners, it's been another amazing, award-winning, chart-topping PowerShell podcast episode. If you liked it, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast platform of choice. Jordan, we're worldwide. We're everywhere. Spotify, Apple Music. You want it, you got it. Leave us a like, comment, subscription if you're on YouTube. And if you have some feedback for us, you can send that to PowerShell at pdq.com or in the PowerShell channel of the PDQ Discord, discord.gg slash pdq. I'm Andrew Plotek. He's DevOps Jordan. And Emil, what an amazing conversation, my friend. Thank if people enjoyed it, where can they tap in with you on the internet? Uh, yeah, so I'm emis.se on my website and uh, on Twitter. My handle is emis, uh, E-H-M-I-I-Z. Uh, 
and a Mastodon. I'm also uh, InfoSec emis, I think. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you guys for having me. It's been a pleasure, super fun uh, to talk PowerShell with you for, for an hour. I would love to talk. I could talk an hour more, I think. But <laughs> it too. has been a pleasure. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the PowerShell Podcast. The PowerShell Podcast is a PDQ production, making device management simple, secure, and pretty damn quick.